The nation is at a crossroads. We've never seemed so divided. Half of the country lives in fear of one presidential candidate. The other half lives in fear of the other. And if the wrong one wins, the consequences for the other side seem catastrophic. This is America in 1800, or 1824, or 1876. Because it turns out that messy politics is kind of our thing. 2024 is an election year like no other. We started out with two presidents running against each other for the first time in over 130 years. They were the two oldest candidates in history. And then one of them stepped aside. Also unusual, how deeply disgruntled the country was about its choices. Polling in early 2024, when it was still a Biden-Trump race, revealed that a majority of Americans were unhappy with both parties' choices for their presidential nominees. And then Donald Trump picked as his running mate J.D. Vance, the first vice presidential nominee in history to have a negative favorability rating. And then Joe Biden was replaced by Kamala Harris, the most unpopular vice president in the history of polling. And regardless of how you feel about any of these individuals, it's a little weird that the system keeps turning out candidates who are so broadly unpopular, which has left a lot of people asking, is our system for picking presidents broken? And here's the thing about that question. Americans have been asking it pretty much since the founding of the country. When the Founding Fathers first debated how the president would be selected, they didn't even agree amongst themselves. Some of them thought Congress should make the choice, but that idea was dismissed as violating the separation of powers. Some of them thought the president should be directly chosen by the people, but that was rejected as excessive democracy. Which sounds elitist to us now, but remember that just a few years ago, it was the people who voted to name an important scientific research vessel Bodie McBoatface. So you can kind of see where the founders were coming from. The compromise the founders landed on was what we now know as the Electoral College. Or more accurately, it's a thing that we continue to call the Electoral College despite the fact that we've changed it over and over again. After all, the founders thought the members of the Electoral College would pick presidents at their discretion. But that ended up just as unpopular as you'd think, and eventually electors just voted the way the people in their states voted. The founders also thought that, in practice, it'd probably be rare for anyone to get a majority in the Electoral College, which would leave it to Congress to pick the president. In reality, however, that only happened one time, in 1824, when Congress didn't pick the guy who got the most votes, and the country went insane over it. And then it also kind of happened again in 1876, but that one's too complicated even for us. The founders also thought that whoever came in second for president should be vice president, which kind of worked until presidential candidates started getting running mates. And then in 1800, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr ran together and ended up in a tie. And given that Jefferson went on to make the Louisiana Purchase while Burr went on to murder a dude and maybe try to steal part of the US to form a new country, Jefferson was probably the right call. And we haven't just changed how we vote for presidents, we've changed how we pick our presidential candidates, which we kind of had to because, believe it or not, this is a thing that is not in the Constitution. In the earliest days of the country, presidential candidates were picked by their party's members of Congress. Then, in 1831, a third party, known as the Anti-Masonic Party, their whole thing was that they hated Freemasons, and hang on to that because it's about to be relevant, created the political convention as a way to choose a nominee. And in the process of doing so, they chose as their presidential nominee, a Freemason. There's a reason these guys didn't last. Pretty soon, the major parties embraced conventions too, although even those weren't much of an exercise in democracy. In many cases, the conventions were just a place for party bosses to choose a nominee in back rooms, which was why, in the early 20th century, we changed things again with the creation of party primaries that finally gave voters more of a say. Kinda. 
Because in many cases, the party bosses just ignored the voters and picked who they wanted anyway. That process didn't really change until around the 1970s, when a series of reforms in both parties gave us the more democratic system we have today. Which is how, over the course of about 150 years, political conventions went from smoke-filled rooms to whatever this is. So, the good news? For the past 50 years or so, the voters have pretty much reigned supreme. The bad news? It's those same voters who pick the candidates that so many people now hate. But actually, there's more good news. Because the process is now so much more participatory, people who are unhappy with the system have never had more ability to change it. That could be as simple as actually voting in a primary. After all, in 2008, the year that set the record for turnout in presidential primaries, only a little over 30% of eligible voters bothered to show up literally every vote counts because sometimes there's like four of them and look even if your state votes too late to make a difference or you're an independent who doesn't want to vote in a party primary you can still push for changes to the broader system in fact america is brimming with precisely those kinds of ideas when it comes to primaries there are proposals to make them open to all voters rather than just members of a party Proposals to give more discretion back to party elders to choose candidates that can appeal to the whole country. And proposals to let voters rank multiple candidates instead of just choosing one. And when it comes to the Electoral College, there are proposals to change it so that states no longer give all their votes to just one candidate. Or even proposals to get rid of it altogether. Some of these ideas may be good, some of them may be bad, and some of them may have unintended consequences. But the most important thing to remember is that none of them are off limits. If our election system is broken, we have the power to change it. And in fact, we've been doing precisely that throughout our history. Because sometimes you look at American politics and you realize things just can't stay the same. Like here, for example. Honestly, more embarrassing than the Freemason thing. <laughs>